would you like to go ahead and begin our program today? Thank you. Okay, thanks, Judy. Our guest speaker today is a very unique individual, Howard Jacobson, who, by the way, was my big brother in college and remains a lifelong friend, has had a very successful business career. But more important, his volunteerism is beyond reproach. Howard has been on 46 different nonprofit boards, has been an officer in 26 of the organizations, including many Jewish organizations in the Kansas City area. However, today, Howard will be talking about the power of one, the true story of a lady named Irina Sandler, who saved some 2,500 children from the Warsaw Ghetto during World War II. A story about her courageous exploits at that time were found by a girl in a small Kansas town. She then created a short play performed by a group of children, which won several awards. When Irina learned of the play, she wrote back to the children with more details of her daring rescues of the children. I could go on and on, but suffice to say, Howard and his wife, Roe, have been actively supporting the students. They've given 35 scholarships to students who have worked on the play over the last 22 years, amounting to more than $200,000. They have also helped in several other ways, but I'll let my good friend Howard talk about that. Fellow Fells members and others, I give you Howard Jacobson. Thank you, Myron, appreciate the introduction. Um, it started back in 2001. I got a call from a friend of mine, John Shugart, who some of you might know, who called me and says, I need some money. I said, you always call me for money. What do you want now? He said, I'm gonna send some kids to Europe, to, to Poland specifically. I said, people are living in Poland. Why would you want to send anybody to Poland? He said, because they wrote a story about a lady. And he told me about lady Irina Sendler. And uh, he said, I want them to go visit her. And he said, you got to go see the play. It's going to be in Kansas City on September the 12th, 2001. You know what happened on 9-11. This was the day after. So anyway, I said, I'll give you $1,000. And he called eight or 10 other people and raised the money. He was able to send these students to see, uh, to meet Irina Sendler in person. And it was interesting because national, the Polish national television followed them around the entire week they were there. The American ambassador invited them to his residence. So they, have, they were wined and dined by a lot of people, including the president of Poland and his wife hosted them also. And uh, they met with the minister of education, a number of other people while they were over there. And these were girls who were uh, 14, 15, 16 years old, never been on a plane before, and all of a sudden they're flying to Poland. They got off the plane, they're weary because they flew all night uh, out of New York and um, they walk out of customs. And all of a sudden there's a whole bunch of people from the press there. And they look around like, there must be somebody famous on this plane with us. Who are, who are they, who's been, a, we don't know anybody on the plane. We didn't see anybody. And all of a sudden the press surrounds these girls and Norm Kennard, who's the teacher. And they start firing questions at them. They said, who are talking to us? What, who are we? Well, there had been a lot of publicity about these girls and the story that they discovered because Poland at that time was, had a lot of guilt feelings about what had happened during the war with the Holocaust and things like that. So they were looking for a hero. And um, there was a book written and it mentioned Irina Sundler and then also this author who had done that book came out with an article in the paper telling who these girls were coming to Poland to meet Irina. So they got a lot of publicity. They had police escorts every place they went. They had uh, one of the top aides to the president of uh, Poland was with them all the time. The wife was with them of Poland, Polish president was with them. So they got wined and dined and treated very well. And so I thought our money went very well. It was very well invested for that. So on 9-11, I called John Shukart, and I said, is the play going to go on tomorrow night? He says, I think it will. He said, I don't know. He said, they haven't decided yet whether they're going to come to Kansas City or not. And he, I said, are you in Kansas City? He said, no, I'm in Chicago. I'm trying to find a car to drive back. All the airlines are shut down and all the car rental places are out. Of, he says, I might not make it to the play. So we went, and it was hard to get my wife to go, but we went. And it was a phenomenal play. It, was, it wasn't a long play. It was like, by that time, it was maybe a 15-minute play. And what had happened, these girls, this one girl, as Myron mentioned, this Norm Kennard is an unbelievable teacher, one of the best teachers I ever met. He has five filing cabinets, five drawers high. So he's got, wow. he's got 25 filing cabinets full of things that deal with, um, with uh, all sorts of tolerance projects. And so this one girl picked this thing out. It was about Schindler and it said okay. other Schindlers. Call and it. so she, she sees this thing about Irina Sundler saved 2,500 kids. So they take it to the teacher and they say, do you think this could be true? And he said, no, I don't think so. 
He's a probably top, top fat finger. Probably supposed to be 250. But you know, write a play. Lady sounds interesting. If she'd have saved that many, the play would have, the, uh, the movie Schindler's List would have uh, been about her instead. So they try and find anything. They can't go on the internet. They only find they find almost nothing on her. There's one mention of her uh, from this article, and that's all. So the teacher is a very innovative teacher. So they said, "What should we do?" And he said, "Well, call the Midwest Center for Holocaust Education in Kansas City, and maybe they know about it." So call them. We don't know about it. We've heard the name, but we know nothing about her. They gave her two numbers to call: one in New York and one in Washington. The Washington was the Holocaust Museum, and the one in New York was the uh, uh, Righteous Gentiles uh, working with them. And so they called both of them. They said, we've got her number. We don't know whether she's still alive, but we know that she's living in a nursing home. So they wrote her a letter of what they were doing on this play. And they waited and waited. And fortunately, uh, the letter came back uh, 10 days before they were gonna present the play to their school. And there were some corrections. She said, she wrote back nine pages, small type, small pr printing. And they, it was supposed it was in Polish, of course. So they said, what do we do? And he said, we'll call the universities around here. Call KU, call Emporia State, call Pittsburgh State and see if everybody speaks Polish. So they found a girl on the second phone call. They call her, they talk to the dean and who gets the, the girl to come to the phone. And they talk to her and she speaks very broken English. And they told her what they've got. Can we come down and talk to you? Yes, uh, but my English isn't very good. So they said, that's okay, you speak Polish, that's important. So she looks at the letter and she's, oh my, she's, this is very small print. And this is what they call high Polish. This lady's very educated. I'm from the country and I don't speak, I'll have to use several dictionaries to get through it. So it took me a week. So luckily he had some more time. So they put the play on in the school. They won that, of course. And then they were going to go to the district and um, they had the play rewritten by then and added a few things that Irina wrote to them. They changed that. They went to state, they won that and they went to uh, Washington, DC. A million and a quarter students start out at the beginning of the year in a National History Day project and try and win going to Washington. There's four or five different categories. There's giving a speech, a dramatic presentation, reading, you can write a paper on it, you can have cartoons, you can have a video you make, or you can have a, a presentation like a play, a dramatic play. So they picked Irina Center to talk about. Well, they got there, their, their uh, set was broken. Uh, they were called up two hours early because the people who were supposed to be there before them weren't there. So they hadn't really practiced like they wanted to. They did not win, but they came in like 30th in their group, which they were disappointed at. But they said, we're not gonna let this story die. We're gonna keep telling it for years to come. Well, they're 14 year old, 15 year old girls. So they got big wishes of what they want to do. So they come back to Kansas City, or they come back to Uniontown, Kansas, which is a town of 115 population, but they got the grade school, high school, and the middle school right there in this little town. And so very few of them really live in the town. They Most of them are farm uh, kids and things like that. And uh, the teacher, a professor, lives in uh, uh, Port Scott, Kansas, which is 15 miles away. And so he motivates these students just to unbelievable. It's unbelievable what he can do with students. So we go see the play and it, I'd read about him in June before we met him. And there was a little article in USA Today. If you read those, they got all the states. And that particular day I was reading it, it mentioned there's a professor, a teacher who um, has tried to go to National History Day 17 times. He's made a 16, which is a record. No one's come close and probably no one will come close in the future. So I thought this would be an interesting guy. I'd like to meet him someday. So then Norm Kennard calls me and uh, I'm sorry, but uh, John Shuga called me to get money to send these kids to Poland. So they went to Poland, met Irina, they come back. The play did go on on, uh, on September the 12th. And it was very emotional because they were talking, they were on, uh, on PBS on the day before and they were just ready to go on when the bombing happened in, in New York. And so they, they, they were cut out, obviously they couldn't talk. So they were excited to come to Kansas City and put the play on. And so afterwards we went up and talked to the uh, uh, teacher and I said, how do these kids get to college? She said, most of them don't go to college from uh, the, less than 50% of the students go to college in the school, but your students, 85% go. How do they go? And he said, well, they really have to borrow a lot of money. So I said, we'd like to set up a scholarship program if possible to help them. And I said, when are you coming back? He said, we're coming back in two weeks. I'd like to take your students to dinner some night and talk to them that night. And he said, well, you can't do that. And I said, why can't we do it? He said, well, it's not only the parents. He said, not only the kids, but he's about 25 or 30 grandparents and parents up here also. I said, we'll take them all to dinner. He said, that's expensive. I said, it made a difference. We'll take them. So we took them to a China Star buffet. Um, and we had a large crowd, like there were probably 45 people that we treated at dinner that night. And everybody loved it because they could really eat all they wanted for you know, a fixed price. And it was, it was free. They were paying for it. So anyway, we, uh, I asked him, well, how are you going to go to college? And the grandparents said, we borrow against the farm. Uh, the parents said, we borrow against the mortgage if we have anything left. And we 
And we borrow a lot of money from the government to try and get our kids to go to college because we want them to go to college. And so I said, my wife and I are gonna try and help raise some money for you to go. And the story really starts there. So we came back, they came back a few weeks later, they wanted to meet us, they wanted to take us to dinner. And I said, no, we're gonna take you to dinner. And the parents said, we'll go by ourselves. You just take the students to dinner, which we did with, with the teacher and uh, the teacher's wife was there, Norm Connor's wife was with them. So we said, you know, we're working on it. We'd like to be able to help you, but here's the deal. And I talked to Norm before we wanted to help all the students. And he says, don't say that. If you say that, then everybody's gonna get the scholarship whether they work on it or not. I want only the ones who really work hard. So tell me you're gonna give five or six or seven. So he told me we're gonna try and raise enough money to give a little bit of money to five or six students. And you gotta work hard to get it. So we eventually gave 35 and actually then this last year we actually gave one more. So we've given 36 scholarships during that time. And word got out very quickly. I was raising scholarship money for these people. And I got some phenomenal calls. Uh, my wife was, co was chairman of the uh, NCJW College Scholarship Committee. So she met with the committee. They came to see the play and we invited the whole uh, board of NCJW and Kansas City to come and see it. And they voted to give extra scholarships to the founders of the three founders. So the story of one came out because this one girl found it. This one lady saved 2,500 people and this one teacher is the one who motivated the students to do something like that. So there's three people who really have the power of one that I talk about in the story. Normally I talk for an hour, but we're gonna cut it down to a half an hour. So I'm gonna give you the highlights of it. There's a book that's been written on it. It was in the Hallmark Hall of Fame. It was the number one film that they've ever done. It was a two hour documentary on the amazing life of Irene Sunday uh, from Hallmark Hall of Fame. You can get it, you can rent it, you can buy, you buy it. I guess you don't, they don't rent it anymore, but you can buy the book called Life in a Jar. And uh, so they met with, we've sent the girls to uh, meet with Irina five times. Uh, and each time they met with more and more people. One time they called, well, they called me and they said, we got a call from the Minister of Education. He wants to come a week later. What do you think is going on? I said, it's a free country. They're not gonna capture you. They're not doing anything bad to you. He's got his reason that these are bureaucrats. They're, gonna, they're, gonna, they're, gonna, they're not gonna tell you the whole thing. So they get there and they ask him again, what's gonna happen? Where are we going? He says, you'll see tomorrow. So he puts him on a train with some of his aides. He, of course, flies. He's going to take an eight-hour train trip. You're going to the mountains. What are we going to do there? You'll see when you get there. Well, they're really nervous because they're still young kids. And they get there, and it turns out that they've got students from 65 or 70 high schools there. And they're going to train all of them. And they have interpreters. they got uh, more than, I forget how many interpreters they had, but they had almost an interpreter for every one of the students. And so they broke out into different groups. And they taught the students the lines on two or three different parts for each one of the students. So they could put that on all over Poland. And today there's 64 schools in Poland that are named for in, in memory of Irina Sundler. So these girls call me after a year or two and they said, we've got a website. We'd like, you'll be the first person outside the school to look at it. So I pull it up and I look at it, I'm kind of laughing and I went embarrassed them, but I said, this looks like it was written by an eighth grader. Yeah, but he's really a smart eighth grader. And I said, yeah, he must be. So I said, let me see if I can improve it. So I talked to somebody who was in the business and they improved the website. Then some lady in Fort Scott improved it more. And then a guy out in California, Lowell Milken, who some of you might've heard of, but he is a very wealthy man. Uh, he's given a lot of scholarships to a lot of people, but he also gives grants to people like Norm Kennard. He gives them $25,000 for a year, tax-free, go do what you want. If you want to take time off of school, take time off. If you want to buy a, you know, put, uh, build a room on your house, do it. He started this back in the 1980s and 1990s. He's given away a lot of scholarship money to that. So he liked what was going on and he saw what Norm was doing. So he spent some money, he brought them out to California and they did it at several temples out there and at the um, seminary out there, the, I think a seminary of the West or something like that. And so uh, they've been all over the country, but I realized that they were driving all these places and they were paying for their own food and everything like that. So I said, let me be your agent. I'll call all these agencies, these schools and the churches and the synagogues and things like that. And they've got a budget, they do. And they pay for us to come out there. Yeah, they'll pay your transportation. So I'd call over the uh, program director and get that taken care of. Do you have money in your budget? Of course we can. Yeah, of course we do. Well, why aren't you offering it to these kids? Well, nobody ever told us they needed money. Well, they're driving there and they're staying cheap motels and they're taking it out of their own pocket. And I said, by the way, these kids are making five and six, seven dollars an hour and they're giving up their job to come to your place. So we got a hundred dollars for each kid to come, which covered their expenses, not expenses, but covered their salary they were giving up. And so all these papers, people called me back and said, we want to donate. We heard you're raising money uh, for a scholarship. So we eventually ended up with almost $200,000. And I made up some more, put some more money into it to make it over 200,000. And so it's an amazing story. And all these girls just did some unbelievable things. They got better as they were doing it. And to, uh, today through last year or year before, they've given over 3,000 press conferences. 
television, radio, newspaper, and magazines. It's been written up and so the, it was interesting. At the end of the first month, they called me, they were so excited, a thousand people had looked at their website and they couldn't believe a thousand people. I said, you're gonna get more in the future. No, everybody's seen it, so wanna see it. We probably won't see them. We we'll, might have a few hundred people look at it. Well, a few months later, they get, or maybe a year later, they get written up in Ladies Home Journal. And there's a seven page article on them on that. And they get a million hits on their website within a week or two weeks. So then they call me on a couple other things. We talk about different things they could do. And one day they call me and they said, how do you nominate somebody for a Nobel Prize? <laughs> I laughed, I said, you can't do it. And they said, well, people get nominated all the time. I said, it's a country that does it. What do you think about Poland? Or you want, you're nominating Norm, Norm Kennard? No, we want to nominate Arena. And I said, well, I think you're out of luck. The Nobel Prize goes to people who've done something in the last one to five years. Some people have gotten it, they did some 10 years ago, but they're getting recognition now. So I said, it's gonna be very hard. What you gotta do is I would, you've, you're in contact with dozens and dozens of the survivors who you met and have come to your plays. And so email all of them and ask them to send you emails uh, written to the president of Poland and why they should help support it. And uh, so, and you, you might get it through. So they sent a whole packet to uh, the, uh, to the uh, Nobel Prize Committee and within four days, they had an answer back. We don't normally do this as one of the few exceptions we're gonna make, but this lady did something fantastic. And the day that the, and they pointed out the day the Nazis left, the communists took over. And so this lady was considered a subversive by the communists and by the Nazis. And uh, she was, I, I don't know how many have read the book or seen the movie on TV or in a, a video, but she was captured by the Nazis. She was tortured. They broke both of her legs and both of her feet trying to get her to tell where the children were. Well, she wouldn't tell them and they were gonna kill her. And so where would she, where would you bury a jar that had the names of all these kids in it. Those who know the, have seen the play or read about it. She had a friend whose home was right across the street from Gestapo headquarters. Now, who would ever think about burying jars across? They would, Gestapo would never look in their neighborhood because they think we've got everybody intimidated. Well, they didn't hear this one person intimidated. So um, they would go out and they had a fence that was uh, a four foot uh, brick wall. And that right next to the brick wall, they put, they had flowers and they had uh, tomato plants and things like that. And they, uh, they buried the jars. They brought, water, they brought 10 or 15 jars of water out and some had milk in it and some were white so that she had a white jar and it had uh, names. And the names of the, of the children, what their given name was, what their made up name was, who they were living with. And if they had any relatives outside of Poland and Germany, that maybe lived in France, England, might be United States, South America, wherever. And she wrote all that on life. That's the reason the book is called Life in a Jar because their lives were right there in a jar. So um, amazing story that goes on. So these girls then decided, well, you know what? Why don't we ask Israel to nominate her also do a joint nomination? Well, I, they've done all these things. They've been on TV by this time several hundred times and on radio and newspaper writing and things like that. So I'm not gonna tell them they can't do it. I said, well, you can try it. So I said, but send all this documentation to Shimon Perez, who's president. He said, we've got his email address and we're gonna send them a whole package. It's gonna be real expensive to send this whole package over with the video and with other things like that. So, but they sent it to them and they get a, an email back a couple of days later saying, thank you. But uh, we've decided to nominate Yad Vashem for our nominee for this year, who we'll consider it in the future. So they get a letter email back from the president. I told them also, do not send it to, to the president of France. Well, how are we gonna get to the president of Poland? Well, how do we get it to him? Well, what we do is I said, send it to his chief assistant who goes with you and also send it to his wife. His wife gets her mail. She doesn't have secretaries who are gonna open it and send you back a form letter saying, thank you, we're already nominating somebody else. So that way the president will get it and make a decision because he really likes you. So um, they get a letter back from, an email back from the uh, president of France, uh, from President Poland, I'm sorry. I keep thinking I'm Macron with what he's doing in, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Russia right now and with uh, Ukraine. Anyway, so. The president of, of uh, Poland says, I'm going, I'll be the first Polish president to go to Israel. And I'll be there in about three weeks. I'm gonna talk to the president of Israel about three things. Trade, our personal relationship, and number three is a joint venture with nominating Irina Sundler. So he goes there and they're so excited they can hardly wait for him to hear back from him because they already know they've been rejected by the president of Israel. So he emails them when he gets back home and he says, success, congratulations. Both of us got nominate her. And so they were so excited. He goes on to tell the story that uh, he talked to the president of Israel about the other two things. We want to more trade with you all, which Israel wanted. We want to have personal relationship between you and me. That was wanted. One more thing. I want you to do a joint nomination 
with Israel and Poland to nominate uh, you know, Irina because there's so many uh, people, survivors living in Israel and she's really helped the, uh, the Jewish people uh, way beyond what she needed to do. So he's, well, we can't, we're nominating Yad Vashem. So the president of Poland, of course, knew that. So he said, well, will Yad Vashem be there next year? Yes. Will it be there five years from now? Yes. Will it be there hundred years from now? God willing, I'll be there. He's, you know, Irene is 97 years old. She's maybe living a year at the most, maybe two years. She's not going to be there in time to, to see your nomination. I think we're going to do a joint. In fact, our whole conversation depends on what you do. I'm leaving in the kind of, well, I got to go to the Knesset. I got to talk to the prime minister. It'll take us months. No, I'm leaving in two days when an answer before I leave. So he said, the president of Israel starts sweating. He said, let me see what I can do. So he said, before I left two days later, we had an answer. It was passed. The Knesset decided to withdraw their nomination for Yad Vashem and do a joint nomination. So when that came out, they had like 5 million hits on their website within a couple of weeks. No one knew who Irina was. She was one of 197 people nominated. But they have two countries nominate one person. It's just remarkable. And these girls, the ones who engineered the whole thing, they wrote to hundreds of the survivors and children and asked them to send flood the, the prime minister's office and the president's office with the stuff. And it was flooded. And uh, the president said, I mean, he's never gotten that many emails from, from all over the world on one person before. And, uh, but it worked. And the, the, uh, obviously, the, uh, so they, uh, six months later, it came out. There's always a leak of the top five or six names. And she was one of the top five or six names on there. And that was shocking because they thought, well, at least she got nominated. We got some press for her before. But when it was leaked that she was one of the finalists, that was really shocking. She didn't get Al Gore got it for his movie, Inconvenient Truth. And so, but still, they had millions of hits on their website. So within five years of starting the website, they had over 50 million hits on their website. And that was in 2009 or 10. Today, they're well in excess of 100 million hits on their website. So it's just constantly a story. They've had no, nothing in the press, but there's people that know about her and see about her and read about her. And there's just, it's an unbelievable story of what these girls did. So it's the power of one girl. They now have given the play 375 times, including like 15 or 20 times when they went to Poland. The most moving thing they had was when they were in Poland, giving it to the survivors because a lot of them recognized themselves in the play. I was the lady that, I was the kid, that kid that got taken by my parents. Here's the spoon that my parents put in my crib or when in the box when they took it out, so they know who I was, and it had her name on there. And one of those girls, one of those ladies, went to Canada, and the other one was uh, was in Poland, and went with a, with a Polish family. So Irina, after the war, went around and talked to all the kids, and explained to them who they were, what their real family was, and you've, either you've got nobody in America, you've got no family, and the, all the families wanted to keep them. They loved the kids the, the, the way they were. Some of the kids wanted to go to America and at least see what it was like, or go to Canada, or go to South America and go to Cuba. Some families had moved to Cuba. And so uh, this is 1945-46. And she said it was horrible because she said, I, had, I, was followed around by, I was followed around by these communists who followed me all the way around. I kept saying, why are you doing this? Let the kids be them. No, I've got, I've got a duty to God and a duty to these families. I told them I'll, I will try and tell, talk to each child after the war. And she rode a horse and a donkey and a mule all over because she had no car and they wouldn't give her a car to go around. So she talked to almost every family. Some families had moved two and three times and she couldn't find them. But interestingly enough, not one family was ever turned in. And if the, if the penalty over there is if you're hiding any Jewish person and they're turned in, not only does it, that person die, well, your whole family dies. So these people took a real risk and the, the uh, monasteries took a real risk of uh, where the nuns were. And they took in literally hundreds of, of these Jewish students and trained them in Catholicism and taught them how to do things right. And so when the Gestapo came to investigate, everybody was had the papers and it was magnificent. It worked out right for them. So she was only sorry she couldn't have saved more people. But so like I said, so she was nominated for the Nobel Prize. She got several awards in the United States and several awards in uh, Canada and several awards in Poland. And they have the Irina Sundler Award that's given out for bravery. That's given out once a year in, in Warsaw. And of course, the government changed. Unfortunately, the president who was so pro-Western uh, was flying back from Russia and the pilot said, we can't take off because of the bad weather. I don't want to crash. And he says, I'm the president. I'm telling you to do it. Uh, fly high enough. Well, unfortunately, they crashed into a mountain on the way back. And they blamed the uh, air traffic controller in, in uh, Russia. But by the time it crashed, it was actually in Polish territory. And it was, they, they couldn't, they, it was, anyway, they, he had passed away. His brother took over and was not that friendly to anybody. And so things have changed and it's gotten worse over there. But anyway, it's just an interesting story what these girls have done. And so they're very accomplished. 
they now are all married, are the ones who started it. And one of them has four children. She still takes off. She does her husband's same with the children when it plays in the, in the Midwest and she'll drive or fly to wherever it is. And, uh, but she doesn't go to New York or California or Florida anymore. But the other ones do, the other two, and they've got, we have eight to 10 kids that come in the, and they're young adults now, but they also have some younger students. In fact, now these three ladies have children old enough that they're gonna be in the play next year and playing some of the roles that, they're, that their mothers have played. So it's a remarkable story. And so like I say, I, I usually talk a bit longer and I gave you the highlights of it. And, uh, but if you wanna read the book, it's, um, it's Life in a Jar by Jack Mayer. And that's a phenomenal story you'll read in, about him, how he found the story. And um, Hallmark Hall of Fame, um, I talked to Donna Adele Hall about it. Um, I'm on, I was on committees with Adele Hall and, and boards with her. And they're, Hallmark Hall, they're from the Hallmark family, of uh, Hallmark Hall of Fame and Hallmark cards and things like that. So anyway, um, their daughter happens to be good friends with a good friend of mine. Um, and so they invited the daughter to come see the play. And she's my parents, they talked about it, they got to come see it. So the next play that came to Kansas City, we invited Donna and Adele Hall to come and they said, this will be on Hallmark Hall of Fame. When you get it from the owner of the company, you know it's going to be there. But it took a few years to get it done. The logistics of doing shooting in Poland and getting the family to sign off on it, uh, it got done. And the Hallmark Hall of Fame said it was the best program and the most watched program they'd ever had. The book, there's 6,000 books on the Holocaust that are on Amazon. This, in the last four years or five years has been out, has ranked number one, two, or three every year of the Holocaust books. So it's really a famous book and the famous author. And he's written several nonfiction books, but this was the only uh, fiction book he'd ever written. He made five or six trips to Kansas City and driving down to uh, Fort Scott and to Uniontown. And we met with him a couple of times uh, when he was in Kansas City and spent three hours with him one time talking about our perception of what's going on uh, with the students and things like that and how great they are and just how Norm is such an amazing person. And he said, well, Norm always plays himself down. He said, the students are great. I said, no, I've talked to students all the time. And they tell me they're average students, but Norm puts them way above average. Interesting thing. So when they go to this National History Day, like it's, if a teacher can get to go one time or two times in their career, it's a big thing. Norm tried it 26 times, made it 25 times during his career. So NEA came out, National Education Association came out to Kansas City, and they were driving down there. And Norm said, we'll talk to Howard Jacobs. So they, they filmed me for 45 minutes. I said, how long is the film going to be? And they said, eight minutes. So I said, well, if you use eight minutes of mine, who else is going to be on there? They laughed. And I said, we're going to use one minute of yours. We might extend this to maybe. He said, you're so articulate. You do such a good job. And you're so passionate about with these people. And I said, something to be a passionate about. You don't see young people doing what they're doing. They're so committed. So it turned out to be about a 12-minute film because they filmed some of the students. They filmed some of the parents talking about it. And they filmed uh, a lot about Norm and about his life. So he, would, he got the Lifetime Achievement Award uh, before he retired from NEA. They gave it to two people each year. And so he was the male and they gave it to one female who got it. So it's very impressive that NEA recognized him for what he could do. He now runs the Lowell Millican Institute for Tolerance in Fort Scott. And they reach out to Norm, uh, this uh, Lowell said, I, I've got a, I got a challenge for you. I'd like you to try and be in a hundred high schools in the next four or five years. And Norm laughs, he said, I can't do that. He's, what do you mean you can't do it? It's not that much. I'm just wanting you to be in a few schools each year. He's, I can be in that many schools in the first six months. He's, I can be in a thousand schools within five years. Well, he's actually in 2,500 schools in America right now working on tolerance projects that didn't have it before. And this little Millican has funded and funded and funded building a new building down there for him in an old style. It's built, almost looks like it was there from the early 1900s, like all the other buildings around it, but it's all new brick. And he bought the lot next to it, and knocked it down and made a park out of it to honor some more people. So anyway, we are right about 30 minutes. So if you all want to ask some questions, I'm happy to answer any. John. John. Okay, Howard, this is fantastic. And uh, I, I know everything that you've done is, is uh, you've underestimated your own part in it. But I was, uh, I think all of us would like to get a little more recap of exactly what Irina did. Uh, you know, we know about the jar uh, peripherally when you mentioned, but could you just, you know, give us a, a, a a, a shark synopsis of how she saved all these kids? There were sewers going into the, uh, the uh, uh, Warsaw Ghetto, and they led to a courthouse, and one of them led to City Hall. And they had, uh, she was part of the underground, and she helped organize uh, saving uh, Jewish people and saving other people who were uh, not in favor of the communists and in favor of the Nazis and things like that. 
And so she would walk through the sewers with the kids and she had a map and a flashlight and she knew which way to go. And sometimes people there to help her. And sometimes she'd drive out and she had an old truck that she drove and she had a German shepherd and she trained it to when she hit it to bark and bark towards, not towards her, but towards the, the guard, whichever the way the guard was. And so she would um, give the baby some drops of something to kind of uh, sedate them. And if the baby woke up and started crying, she'd hit the dog and the dog would start barking at the guard and he'd say, get out of here, go on, you, gotta, you come in here every day, get out of here. What do you have? Well, I'm taking another baby who died, the typhoid or this diphtheria or whatever, I'm taking out to bury it. So she did that literally thousands of times. A lot of times she could not get out with kids because there were too many guards that were watching her. So she would have to come and go and they'd search her truck. And a lot of times they would tell her, uh, the people in the, in, the, in the ghetto would tell her which gate, gate to go out of because they're sloppy. They're not doing, they're, they're smoking cigarettes and they don't care, they just wave people through. So she'd go to that gate and go out of that gate. And, but she always had an excuse of why she was there. She's taking kids out who uh, diphtheria and they're dying and they're gonna spread it to everybody and things like that. Or they got small packs or they got whatever they got. So uh, then also um, she had other ways again, they had other people that had to go in there for construction workers. And so she would um, make a box with a false bottom in it and sedate the baby and put it in the box underneath it. And they look in the box and they see all these tools. Well, you know, it looks like it's flat and it looks like it's there. So she got them out and she was in charge of this whole project. And even when she got, she, after she was saved and she couldn't walk, she still wanted to go into uh, the concentration camp. They said, you can't, if you go in there, you'll never come out. They will capture you. And we, they hid her and she never got to go back in. Uh, but she did rescue 2,500 or she actually rescued 2,500 and there were more that were rescued by her group. Or maybe she rescued 2,200 and several hundred recovery were done by her group, but she did the bulk of them. And it was interesting when we sent her money um, that she gave it away. She gave it to the other survivors. She gave it to survivors or to the people who were who work with her on rescuing the people. Should they need it worse than I do? So that, is that good, John, or do you want me to talk more? John, you need to unmute yourself. Okay. Yeah, well, I want to talk about the jar. Okay, so like the jar was what she, she wrote the names. She had the, uh, the name of, the, of their given name. She asked the parents, do you have any relatives who live in Europe or in America or any place in the world that's not over in Poland or Germany? And a lot of them said no. So she said, okay. So she wrote it down, none. And, um, but then she wrote down what family they were with, what the address was, hoping people wouldn't move in that two, three, four year period of time. And like I, so they, she was able to go back and she found well over 2000 out of the 2,500 uh, without a whole lot of effort. And the other one, she found some more. Uh, they never found all 2,500, but like I said, no one was killed. None of the families were killed for sheltering these Jewish kids. So it was a remarkable story. And there's more, you, I, I don't wanna give you everything because I'd like you to read the book or see the movie. And the movie and the book are a little bit different. Um, I think the book is more realistic. Uh, there's some things in the movie that they admit are staged for drama. Um, but anyway, so like I said, it's still either one of you read is, or see the movie, both are me very close. Thank you. Steve, uh, Steve Radinsky and Myra have, have their hand up and then, then Marilyn, you'll be next. Yeah, uh, hi, how you doing? Good, how are you doing? It's, it's been a few years, right? <laughs> like, maybe 60 or so. Yeah, nice About 60 you. years. Uh, remember uh, Mattel stock? You told me to buy Mattel? Yes, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> I do remember that. Yes. Paid, paid for my college education. <laughs> Good. Good. Anyway, ha ha have you uh, <laughs> thought about putting this on Broadway? Um. Hallmark Hall of Fame is actually talking about it. They're debating whether to do it or not, uh, but they would, they've got the rights to it. They have and the rights, okay. They do, and there's other people have talked about doing it. They've talked to Hallmark, but they aren't sure this is a really a Broadway play because it's, it's so involved and so confusing. Uh, but like I say, it has been talked about, and they were talking about making really a, another full-length movie that's more dramatic that would be based on some fiction and some fact. That would be more, than, but it's, this is already two hours long, so I don't know how much longer they could make it. And they were talking about making a miniseries out of it, but it, nothing has happened since then. So I think that, you know, it'd be hard to cross the, uh, do better than the Hallmark Hall of Fame one. Okay, well, if you're still thinking about Broadway, give me a call. Okay. <laughs> I, I can help you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so we had Marilyn had her hand up and then Myron, I think you had your hand up. So let's Marilyn next. Okay, thank you so much. I have ne never heard of her until you, until your uh, talk. 
Anyway, I was looking it up a little bit when you talked, and this has nothing to do with helping the Jews, but it said that she wasn't Jewish, and I was, if that's true, I, that's true. I'm asking she was Catholic. you. She was Catholic. Okay. Okay. And then I would like to know what actually motivated her. There was an experience in her life or anything to help the Jews. Thank and, you. you know, to put her own life in danger and everything and tortured and so forth. That's a good question. Her father was a doctor and he was helping a lot of poor people. And a lot of those were Jewish people. And so he told her when she was a little girl, she, he said, it's incumbent to save people's lives. And even if you can't swim, you see someone drowning, it's incumbent on you to jump in and try and save that person. Even if it cost you your life, at least you tried. And you did it with God's will for trying to save them. So she thought of that and she was a social worker. And when she was going through social work in class early in the Nazi era, uh, the communists, I don't know who was running a country at that time, but maybe the Nazis were in there. Anyway, they didn't want the Jewish people to be in the classes with her. So she went over and sat on the Jewish side with the Jewish students. They separated the students. And she sat on the Jewish side because I'm, I'm sympathetic to them. And so she, she was always for the underdog, whoever that was. And so she, um, she just felt like it was her duty uh, to help people. And she was a social worker her whole life. And then she was heading the department at that time for helping uh, in the, in the uh, refugees and things like that. But she, of course, for the, when the Germans came to investigate, there were no records in, the, in there. And they looked through all the records and they couldn't find anything in there. They had no idea who the, who the underground was. But the underground was mostly people she recruited uh, to work. And they were very good people. Hmm. Interesting. Thank you. So, Myron, you need to unmute. Sorry. Um, you were talking about hiding the baby, you know, in the, in the uh, bottom of the uh, boxes or whatever. What was the age range of the kids that they say that she saved? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know exactly how old they went, but the youngest ones were really babies. And as far as I know, they were up to um, like um, eight to 10. And those they smuggle out through the uh, sewers and things like that. And she, they said, how about the sewers? She says, it's bad. She, I don't want to get into it, but she said there were dead rats down there and there were a lot of other stuff down there and people's um, bowel movements were down here. We're wading through that stuff. And the kids have no shoes, no nothing. And so we washed them as soon as they got out of there. So, um, but I think, they, they, I think there were 14, 15 year old kids that she was taking out also, but I'm not sure how old uh, the maximum age. She okay. actually also smuggled some adults out who they, she thought would, could help with the, um, um, with the fighting and the underground and things like that, because they could speak multiple languages. Many of them uh, had been raised in Germany and came back to Poland. And so they were fluent in that. Some were fluent in English. And so, so it was a good idea to have people who could speak multiple languages. And so they actually had people sometimes, uh, they had some German uniforms, which we heard about later. And she had people uh, pretending to be uh, German soldiers to get things done. And they'd go in with, with fake passes and things like that and bring some people out because they're going to be um, questioned by uh, the Gestapo or by someone like that. And then they got them out and they were free. And they gave the term over the underground, but that didn't happen very often. There was a few cases when they were willing to take a risk like that, so. And second of all, Judy, how can we get um, the play here in, in St. Louis? Maybe have the J sponsor them. Yeah, we'll have to make some contacts over here or um, um, Howard, you also know, um, uh, Mrs. Little over at the JCCA, I think you said. Yeah, yeah maybe. Lynn. Yeah, Lynn Little. I couldn't remember her first name. Yeah. So, um, yeah, we'll have to um, make it the connection and see if we what we can do to. Yeah, and here. and maybe um, I can help or John can help, and yeah, we can get over there and get them over here. I think uh, maybe okay. Howard, Howard could come with them or something. That's what I would. <laughs> over. Uh, I we they are not doing anymore. They had. Their last play that they did was January of 2020. And they had plays booked for uh, like four or five plays booked for the rest of the year. And the next one was going to be the end of March. And of course, you know what happened in March, the whole country shut down. And so then they were going to schedule some plays for 2021. And they thought, well, President Trump said this is going to be gone very quickly. It didn't get gone very quickly. So um, they um, waited and then they decided, well, we're going to skip 2022 because it's too iffy. So they're hoping to restart in 2023. But the problem is they've got um, all the actors are, have older families now. 
And they said, it's hard for them to get away and go very far. Well, St. Louis, I think they can get to and back in you know, overnight trip or something like that. They're not really fond of that, but they will go to New York if they get two or three plays to do or East Coast or West Coast or wherever they're going. So but I think if you put in a bid early, they would talk to you about it. Um, you can contact Life in a Jar, or you can go into the um, Little Millican Museum for Tolerance, and it's .org or something like that. You can find it on there. You start typing in, it'll come up, and then go to the Life in a Jar. Um, and we're looking at Life in a Jar. If you're looking at Irina Sundler, um, there's stuff on here. There's another Irina Sundler that is a, it's a fiction written about that she was a plumber, and she went there to fix the plumbing, and it's not true. She was a social worker, and she did not go in there to fix the plumbing. So, and, but there's other stories that were written about her that were not that were not true. So these girls have the the biggest file because it's all first hand impressions and, and discussions with Irina and with the survivors and uh, with the uh, people who uh, helped rescue her. So, any other questions that I can answer? Um, uh, L, you need to unmute. Hi, Howard. Good to see you, and this was wonderful. Thank you. We always enjoy hearing your stories. Um, anyhow, you were mentioning a website that's been getting all the hits. I'd like to know the website so that we can view everything that's been going on. It's irenasendler.org. Okay, thanks. And, then it's, and it might be something else after it, like the project. In fact, it's irenasendler.org, the project, I think is what the actual one to go to is. That's more expansive than the other one. Also, the if you go get to it through the uh, Lowell Milken, um, uh, Lowell Milken, and go into the uh, so the uh, what did I just say? Um, Irina Sendler. No, uh, but if, before that, uh, Lowell Milken uh, Tolerance Project, and then slash uh, Irina. They'll take it to there, and then from there you go to Irina Sendler Project, and both are pretty much the same website. But one might be more expansive than the other one. It's been a while since I've looked at either one of them. Mm -hmm. Well, it would be great if we could have the play here. That would be wonderful. Thank you. So, John? Yeah, Howard, uh, uh, a couple of things about Irina. Did she meet the, uh, the original girls when, she, uh, when they went over there? Yeah, good story. Thank you for asking. She met them. They were over there five times while she was alive. Four times while she was alive. They went back the fifth time when she was not alive. But um, the time when they, she went, the last time they saw her, interesting story, uh, she was in a coma for two weeks before. And so they called uh, the girls, they called Dorm Canard, and they said, we're not sure she's going to be alive. She'll probably be gone, but you can go visit her grave or something like that. Do you still want to come? Yes, we want to come. So they get there, and they're getting there like on a Thursday. On Tuesday, Irina woke up, and she said, what day is it? And they said, Tuesday. What's the date? They tell the date. She said, good, my girls aren't coming for two more days. When they get here, I want to see them. And the doctor says, no, you're, you're not in good shape to see them. You might get too excited. She's I'm 98 years old. If I die, I'd rather really die with them there than to die not seeing them. I want to see them. I'll live to see them. So they, they brought in a beautician. They dressed her up. She not had a nice dress on. She was sitting up to see them. And they were shocked at what great condition she was in. And she said, you come back next week before you leave. I'm going to say goodbye to you. They said when they came back, they could tell that she was really, really in bad shape. And she couldn't sit up. She was in bed. She held each of their hands and said, this is our last time. So anyway, uh, they did have a chance to meet her. Then they went back one more time to talk to more of the survivors, to some of the uh, the people rescued her. And the Norm has sponsored a couple of tricks, trips of taking adults over there. My biggest mistake was helping these kids go over there six times and never going over once to meet Irina. I was always busy that week. Never knew I was going to, I can't tell you what I did, but I could tell you if I'd have seen her or met her. So admitting one big mistake I made. Anyway. Uh, it's been a fun journey. Marilyn, uh, and then John, you have something else. I, I, a follow up on, uh, uh, yeah, I know in Israel they have the uh, righteous Gentiles. Is she, uh, is she in that garden or? Thank you. She, we, we went over there and we're looking through uh, Poland. We can't find her name. So with the guide and I said, you know, this Irina Sunder did some great things. How come she's not in here? She says, who's she? Uh -huh. I, said, I can't believe you don't know who she is. So she's laughing. I think, okay. So we get up to get right at Yad Vashem. She says, Howard, turn around. I turn around and there's a tree and a monument to her right outside of Yad Vashem. For her and the guy, and I can't think of his name, who was a Swedish diplomat who rescued oh. several thousand people and wrote uh, documents for her and the, the communists killed him. And um, 
So anyway, there's her chin. So she's got the most prominent place next to um, the guy. One of you might think of his name. Anyway, so yeah, she's real, very well recognized. And then when you go to Washington DC uh, for the Holocaust Center, she's, her, she's, her pictures are around there several times. And the children she rescued are in there uh, in, the, in the thing. So it's quite an amazing story, known all over the world. Oh, cool. Marilyn? Let me turn this off just a second. Uh, okay, uh, on the Chromebook, by the way, it showed the picture of the tree. I thought that was interesting. But the thing I would like to just mention, is, which I think is unfair, it also said she was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize, and she lost out to Al Gore uh, for his views and so forth on climate change. To me, that is completely unfair that I think she should have gotten the Nobel Peace Prize, certainly over him. Well, I agree, but uh, we're not on the committee. So I think it was great, great that she got uh, nominated and that she got uh, one of the final uh, five or six finalists in the group. Mm -hmm. So we were thrilled with that. It would have been nice if she'd have gotten it, but uh, that was almost asking for too much. Uh -huh. so, okay, and the people above you. her did some really fantastic things, but I can't tell you who they are like offhand now. But I looked at it and said, well, they did some good things also. But she did something over a, a multi-year period of time and risked her mm -hmm. life every time she went into the Warsaw Ghetto. Mm -hmm. So. Thank you. Do we have some more questions, comments? Howard, this was if, really a wonderful. If not, I got one more actually, thing. Uh, well, and maybe, actually, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, well, and actually, Eunice uh, Reitman has a question too, but. Yeah, so um, I mentioned, you know, how difficult it is now for these women to get away. They have families that, you know, is there anything that is being done to um, train others or get others more involved and invested so that the story will continue down the line when um, perhaps they aren't as capable or able to do that? Yes, good question. They are training students across the country to do it locally, uh, but everybody, everybody wants the original. You know, if you can get the original people, or what, do you want the uh, Broadway, the Broadway people who do the Broadway plays? Or you want the uh, the crew that travels on the road? You want the Broadway play if possible. So these are this is really the Broadway play, and these are the, the girls who started, did the found it, and so they can talk from a first name basis and the, the, the actually going there. And unfortunately, they didn't take many of the girls over, many of the students over to see to meet Irina. So. That's the only ones, this is the, the five or six girls and they kind of rotated their eight or nine that actually got to go at least one time in their career. So, but yeah, they're training them. And like I say, in Poland, they've trained several hundred students to do this play around the country because they really re reinforce it. Linda, Linda has a question. Uh, yes, um, first of all, thank you. This has just been a wonderful program. But my question is she was Catholic and she was helping the Jewish people. So is this play and story only directed to the Jewish people? Because again, um, to me, particularly with the rise in anti-Semitism and the Holocaust denying that goes on, um, her story would be very, very helpful if it was put out there for the non-Jewish communities. There were over 4 million people that saw the Hallmark Hall of Fame the first night it was on. And it's been seen by millions more since then. Their plays are actually given in more churches than they are in synagogues. Oh, good. Thank you. And they've been given in YMCA's, they've been given in college universities and colleges across the country. So usually when they go to an area, they do two or three or sometimes four plays in two days or three days. And so when they came to Florida, uh, we sponsored them coming down to Naples and um, they talked to the Federation, I gave the play for Federation one time, they gave it for the community another time. And they were, um, when they come to Kansas City, they put on, they would usually do three or four plays. And uh, part of it was in, like I see churches or uh, YMCA, uh, UMKC put it on for them, let them have the, uh, the stage there. So they, there are a lot of people who are not Jewish who are seeing the play. Great, thank you. I'm not seeing another question, Howard, you had something you wanted yes. to add? I can tell you one other thing. So I always worry about um, how people are living. And I know that life in Poland was pretty difficult. Um, even when we were look, working on this thing in the uh, early uh, 90s or in the late 90s and early 2000s, 
So there's a man who had been in Poland uh, for, the, uh, for the agency, a Jewish agency, Svi Fine. And why, when we got involved with him, we, uh, Kansas City was working with um, Bulgarian Romanian. So he was in charge of that. But he had mentioned when he was in Kansas City, he worked with uh, Poland. So I called him in Israel and I said, so I need you to go back to your Polish days and tell me, uh, you ever heard of Irina Senna? He says, sure. He says, I know her. I said, you met her? He says, yes. I said, what kind of conditions does she live in? He says, well, for Poland, it's okay. I said, tell me what okay means. Well, there's eight ladies in a large room and she's living in that room. And I said, can she get outside? No, because the elevator is broken and she's on the second floor. So they have to, she's in a wheelchair. She's been in a wheelchair for many years. So they don't have to carry her down the steps, which is very hard to do, or she's just upstairs. And I said, do they have a TV? Yeah, but it's broken. <laughs> and I said, how often does the doctor come to see her? Well, the doctors come like every three to four months and they see everybody in the nursing home within one day. So they give them about five minutes. I said, okay. He said, what do you want to do? I said, here's what I want to do. Find out what it costs to get a private room for her. Whew. He said, that's going to be expensive. I said, okay, tell me what it costs. I said, also, do they have a telephone in the room? Well, no, she has to go down the hall to talk on the phone. I want a private phone in her room. I want a color TV set for her and get a color TV set for her sweet mates. And also, I want to find out about the food. I want to find out about the medicine. Can we get American medicine? He said, I wouldn't get American medicine. He says, too expensive. He said, we can get Germany, France, England, places like that can get medicine for her. And I said, don't do this for her. I don't want to create uh, anti-Semitism. So I wanted to go for everybody who's doing it in there. And so I said, um, hey, a lot of confusion here. Anyway, so I said, find out what it costs. So he calls me a couple weeks later and he says, Howard, this is really going to be expensive. Well, I'm thinking several hundred dollars a month for this private room. I said, okay, lay it on me. He said, you're not going to believe this. She's sitting down. I said, yeah, I'm sitting down. He said, how about this? $40 a month for the private room. I said, is that expensive? He said, in this country, it's very expensive. He said, you know, even in 1990 or in 2003, people are not making a lot of money. So retired people like that can't afford it. That's the reason I put them in a suite. And, um, I said, what about the TVs? Well, those are more expensive. But he said, we'll get two nice TVs. And I said, how about the phone? He said, another big expense, $10 a month for a private phone. I said, I'll buy that. And I said, how about the food? And he said, we'll take care of the food. So I said, what's it add up to if we do this for two years? So he said, eh, it's going to be $1,000, <laughs> maybe a little more. I said, we're in. He said, we're paying for it. He said, you gave us the idea. If you want to send us a check, thank you but we're gonna pay for it. And I said, no, I'd like to pay for it. So we, I raised a couple thousand dollars and sent it to the Jewish agency and got the nicest note back from her sweet mates uh, thanking us for what we did. And thank you, Irina sent us a little note uh, through her daughter thanking us for what we did for her. So anyway, it's just one, and the other thing, I, the other good question. I didn't wanna make this whole, the scholarships all about just the people who are in the program. So I set up in a different way and I also wanted to keep the program going. So the original people got, um, the three students got $16,000 each, $4,000 a year. The ones who were in the play got $1,000 a year for being in the play. Then the ones who weren't in the play, uh, who came along later, got $1,000 a year for it. And then the other students um, that were not in the play, but if they won, I didn't want to make it just about what they did for our people, but I wanted to make it with the whole thing. So anybody in Uniontown or Fort Scott or in that county that won and went to state, if they won the state, then they got a $1,000 scholarship per year for four years. And if they won a national, we doubled it. They would get $2,000 a year. So it's been, it's been I, <laughs> I spent a lot of money, but I think it's worth it. Uh, Cause we met a lot of the students at least one time or two times. And um, so it's been, a, it's been an interesting trip. And uh, I would never uh, go back and do anything. The only thing I do different, like I say, is go visit Irene at least once or twice. That's the one thing I missed out on. But just knowing the students, and I'm still in touch with them and their families. And we got invited to most all their weddings. We went to several of the weddings that were close by. And uh, they were like part of the family. When they come to Kansas City, they call and say, we're coming to Kansas City. Can we oh, I can show them how big our children are now? Bring them over. So we go down there once or twice a year and uh, visit with them. And we're, we're in a bit, they, we always tell Norm Kennard and uh, one of the ladies, uh, one of the girls who was one of the original areas of the play now works in that, um, in that area and uh, works in the uh, Tolerance Museum. And so she calls two or three of the girls who are still uh, in the town and says, you got to come over and see Howard and Rover coming down. You got to come see them. So they come to visit us and bring their kids or bring pictures of their kids if they're in school. So it's been a nice, uh, nice relationship we've built. Uh, uh, Steve, do you have another? Or... Yeah, uh, Howard, uh, in Poland, there is a new museum 
that's just magnificent. It's a thousand years of Jewish life I've been in. You could spend a week in this museum. I've never quite seen a museum about Jewish life for a thousand years, the way they've done it. Do you know if, if there's anything presented about her in that museum? And if not, maybe, I, I think that it would be a great place to uh, uh, have, us, have her story there in the museum. I, I don't know whether it is or not. I can find out um, through Norm Kennard and through his connections and uh, through this little Milliken, uh, I think was instrumental in helping to build that over there. So I'll find out more about it. And that's a good point. I'm sure she's mentioned over there because she was famous all over Poland and yeah. she made it, she, and she oh. won an award that's given once every century. And she won it for the century, for that century, uh, for the award. And yeah. then there's one that's given every 10 years to somebody who did something outstanding. And she, it was interesting, she was up against the, the wife of the president of Poland who had done a lot of remarkable things mm -hmm. and she won the award. And she couldn't go to the ceremony, so the wife of the president of Poland went to accept it for her. And there was an award given to the United States for, by Polish people, who gave it to Irina. And the president of the of, uh, the wife of the president of Poland flew over to accept the award on her behalf. And she and the president went to give the award to Irina. Yeah, so I right found now, the trip to Poland extremely interesting. Probably more interesting than when I went to Israel. It, it's just amazing over there. Uh, the the history that you learn over in Poland about the Jews and. And, and their long history there. So if anybody ever thinks about, if you want a great trip, uh, Poland, Lithuania, Estonia, and Latvia, it's, 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 it's just an amazing Jewish trip, those four countries. Well, one of my grandmothers came from the Pale, which is sometimes Poland, sometimes Russia. And yeah. she says, never go back there. They don't like it. <laughs> my other grandmother came from Germany and says, no, go, never go to Germany. Don't ever go to Germany. So I've never gone to either place. I listen to my grandmothers. So, like I said, I was torn because I really wanted to go meet Irina, but I thought, well, do I really want to disagree, disobey my grandmother? So, anyway, I probably would never go, but we've been to Israel three times and going back again. I got a son who is now in the paratroopers and the special forces of the paratroopers. And he got, he joined last uh, April and he's already a sergeant. He just, he finished his uh, commander training. Uh, so he is a, a sergeant. He's going to send him in to be a platoon, a squad leader right now. And they're talking about he, that he got to go full time. He's not going to go full time. I, I hope not. But anyway, he's he's doing his dream when he. Howard, he's your grandson, not your son. Your grandson. My, my grandson. I'm sorry, my grandson. Did I say son? <laughs> I apologize. My grandson, who's 21, he'll be 21 in June. So yes, but he's uh, he wanted to do this when we took him over to Bar Mitzvah when he was 13, and he talked to soldiers all the way everywhere we go. He talked to soldiers and sees these guys the red beret and he goes over. And he spends 20 minutes talking to them all in Hebrew. And so he comes back and he says, Grandpa, that's what I want to do. I said, what? He's their paratroopers. And I said, oh, my God. I just want to just join the American Air Force. That's why I was in. He said, no, I'm going to go over there. So he went over there and he joined, got into um, basic training, then went through um, his uh, paratrooper training. And then he heard about the basic, he heard about the uh, special forces and he qualified for that. Anyway, I know it's almost 11 o'clock. So if you want to cut off duty, that's fine. Oh, yeah. Does anyone else have another question or a comment that you'd like to add today? Howard, the only thing I keep going back to, it's Marilyn Alton again, is how unusual, oh, I don't know if unusual is the right word, how a woman did all this and she wasn't Jewish. To me, that's what, <laughs> I just keep going back to that point because it's so amazing. I mean, it's so wonderful, but, you know, how often do you hear that? Well, if you go to Israel and they've got the garden right outside the Holocaust Center over there, um, Yad Vashem, and you walk through that and there's literally thousands of people who were the rights of Gentiles that helped people. They, they risked their lives because if they would have been, many of them were found and were they not only were they killed, but their whole family was killed because of that. So there were literally thousands of people and there's thousands that died doing it and they don't know the names of the people, they, so they can't trace everybody. But they said there's probably 10 to 15,000 people, which is a small number. You look at Poland, Germany, uh, Lithuania and all the other countries, Belarus and all these other countries there that stood up and helped people. Um, but they did it because they thought it was the right thing to do. So well, I agree was, with you. Course. It was unfortunate that the, you know, the Nazis took over and nobody knew about Irina or what she'd done until after the Nazis and after uh, the, uh, the communists fell. And so then started, they started, but they did take her, they took her to uh, Yad Vashem and recognized her at Yad Vashem. Uh, but then there was no publicity in, in uh, Poland whatsoever that she was gone. And she came back and she got an award there. They didn't want to write the government, the communist government did not want to recognize her. And this one man wouldn't have written a book about the about the conscious uh, Poland. Uh, 
they may or may not know much about her until these girls wrote the book and wrote the story about her. And they, it was broadcast all over Germany, all over Germany and, uh, and Poland. And the book, by the way, has been published in Polish, uh, German, Russian, and Chinese. And the Chinese offered to pay the author one penny for every book that sold. <laughs> you laugh, one penny, when you sell a thousand copies, I'm gonna get a dollar or something like two, ten dollars. They said, no, we're gonna sell a million copies of it over here. He said, donate to charity. So it's, it's going to help other people. So anyway, I, don't have my, I have no idea how many are sold in those countries. Thank you so much, Howard. This was really, um, John, did you have another something? Well, I just know? wanted to say what you're saying. Thank okay, you go right, you go right ahead. <laughs> and I also wanted to say, I converse with Eunice and Wallenberg is the guy, is the thank you. Yes, we all Wallenberg, Raw Wallenberg, that's correct. Wallenberg. But thank you on behalf of Fell and the Mirowitz, uh, Foundation and uh, St. Louis community for uh, enlightening us on uh, this wonderful uh, woman, uh, uh, this righteous Gentile, and and the the, the wonderful teacher in uh, Fort Scott that uh, uh, brought this all to light. Uh, I appreciate it and thank you and thank you for all you've done for the community. That community. my pleasure. I feel it my obligation, my duty. So thank you very much for inviting me. Yeah, see you at the next reunion. <laughs> I see Jane Rubin on there. So thank you. Hi, Jane. <laughs> Thanks, Howard. We appreciate all you've done. Thank you. Okay. So we'll Goodbye. keep in touch. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. Bye. Thank you. Hope that wasn't too disturbing for you. <laughs>